Thank you. There are over six billion people on the planet who live on less than $2 a day. What happens when those people get sick? How can they afford to go to a doctor and take a test and find out what, what's wrong with them? The answers to the diagnostic needs of the patients at the bottom of the healthcare pyramid can be found in our children's toy boxes, on the kitchen counter, on the poster for this weekend's rave. All we have to do is open our eyes to the possibilities of everyday objects and phenomena. This map shows that the world is a dangerous place. The darker the color of red, the more deaths due to infectious disease. Diseases like flu, diarrheal disease, malaria, tuberculosis, HIV AIDS, scarier sounding things like Ebola, chikungunya, the Zika virus. But the other thing that you should notice from this map is that the vast majority of this burden re resides in the developing world. In my lab, we study malaria. Malaria is a parasitic disease that you can contract when you're bitten by a female infected mosquito. The map on the top shows the some 91 countries and over 200 million clinical cases of the disease that occurred in 2015. The bottom part of that map shows that unfortunately everywhere on the planet that we have malaria, we have drug-resistant malaria, which means it's more difficult to fight. But how can I relate the massive burden of this disease to everybody in this auditorium? Let's try this out. On April 14, 1912, the ocean liner RMS Titanic struck an iceberg at about 11 p.m. Within three hours, she sunk to the bottom, and 1,517 men, women, and children perished in the frigid waters of the North Atlantic. In 2015, in sub-Saharan Africa, 435,000 people died from malaria. Most of them were children under the age of five. That's almost a titanic a day of deaths from a disease that is largely curable. Now, if James Cameron really wanted to make a movie about a tragedy, I have a suggestion. Now, what could a single chemist do in light of these massive numbers? William Osler, one of the founders of modern American medicine, once said there are three phases to treatment. Diagnosis, diagnosis, and diagnosis. When you go to the hospital with an unknown ailment, you have a full-service clinical diagnostic lab at your disposal. They have the most modern medical equipment, electronic record keeping, and some of the most highly trained technical staff on the planet all working with your team to find out what's wrong with you. This is what a full-service clinical laboratory looks like at my research site in Zambia, Africa. Many such sites have decades-old hand-me-down equipment. Maybe there's a light microscope, like the one you used in high school biology class. There's no reliable electricity. The only clean water you have is the clean water you carry into the clinic every morning. And instead of highly trained technical staff, we have tirelessly dedicated community health care workers who serve the role as nurse, technician, and public health officer. This is the world of a low resource setting, low resource medicine, and low-resource diagnostics. The buzzword around new innovations in low-resource diagnostics is what we call ASSURED. ASSURED stands for affordable, sensitive, specific, user-friendly, a rapid and robust, equipment-free, and deliverable. If we can make ASSURED diagnostic devices, we can then provide the necessary uh, health care that our patients in low-resource settings need. The challenge we're facing 
is being able to give a patient an accurate diagnosis as quickly as possible for as little money as possible. And assured diagnostics are the first step to reaching that goal. Now, the most common assured device is what we call the Rapid Diagnostic Strip Test, or RDT. In the most familiar forms of this test, you add a sample, blood or urine, at one end of the test, and it runs down the strip, like in a home pregnancy test that you buy at the drugstore. A pregnancy test is looking for hormones in the urine that are produced when you become pregnant. These hormones are the test target. And over time, they accumulate at the end of the strip, and they form a line. The more targets you have, the darker the line. No line, no targets, not pregnant. But the problem with rapid diagnostic tests in low-resource settings is that for many of the diseases that we're interested in, these tests simply aren't sensitive enough. That means a patient could be sick even though the test told him he or she was well. So how do we solve this problem? How do we make these tests more sensitive without making them dramatically more expensive? The answer is origami. Now, you all probably know somebody who's talented enough to fold the paper left and right and forwards and backwards and follow these directions and create these amazing paper figurines. You've seen them, the cranes, whales, flowers, even Yoda. Okay. But did you know that origami has been used to solve some really challenging engineering problems? It was with origami that engineers were able to figure out how to pack an airbag into the dashboard of your car. Mechanical engineers use this concept of paper folding to design the crumple zones that protect your family from an automobile accident. And biomedical engineers designed a stent that would collapse and be small when it was inserted into your vein, but could be unfolded and made rigid to improve your circulation. But how in the world is origami going to get more targets on the test to make the test more sensitive? Well, Imagine that we modify the rapid diagnostic strip test. One side is the test just like it was before. But on the other side, we have a filter. This filter allows us to add much larger volumes of blood or urine that simply flow through the test without disturbing its performance. The targets bind to the filter. And when we're done, we simply fold the filter over add a reagent that releases the targets from the filter, the targets run down the test, and we now are looking for many, 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 many more targets which produce the line we need to tell people that they're sick. But this isn't the only kind of origami RDT we can make. We can make very complicated devices that we print on a piece of paper, fold it up. It's essentially a diagnostic lab on paper. We can look for multiple diseases at the same time. And when we unfold the disease, the, the origami structure, rather than seeing a simple test line, what we have at the center is a QR code a quick response code, just like the ones that you see in your magazine or that on the back of a uh, soda bottle or advertising this weekend's band. And using the cell phone app, you can read that QR code, and it immediately links the patient to the doctor. It tells the patient the use-by date of the test they just took. It allows us to fight counterfeit tests. We can also find out information about when and where the test was performed. Now, these origami and QR origami tests require no additional technical skill other than the ability to fold paper and use a cell phone camera app. Cell phone camera app, the same cell phone camera app that is used around the world. They also only cost 37 cents a test.
to mass produce. But these QR and origami RDTs are what I like to think of as RDT 2.0. What if you really wanted to think outside of the box and create an entirely new way to make a diagnostic? I don't know about you, but for me, that first cup of coffee or first pot of coffee is a little more important than it probably should be. And I'm not too tidy about making that pot of coffee. There are grounds on the counter, there's maybe sugar, and there's always these coffee ring stains. We've all seen them on our kitchen counters. But how are they made? Well, it turns out that a simple cup of coffee is not a simple cup of coffee. It's not what we chemists would call a solution. What it is is a suspension of particles. Your cup of coffee is full of all kinds of fine grounds that were so small they just flowed straight through your filter into your cup. You've seen these when you let your coffee get cold and that stuff gathers at the bottom of your cup. Those are the particles I'm talking about. Now, what happens when you spill a drop of coffee is that the water begins to evaporate out of that drop. And it evaporates fastest at the very edge of the drop. So when the water is evaporating out here at the edge, the water and the particles in the middle flow in a specific direction to the edge so that when all the water's gone, what you see are coffee rings. It's called the coffee ring effect. Now, my colleague Rick Hazelton and I realized that we could take this coffee ring phenomena and turn it into a biological assay for the detection of malaria. All we would have to do is make a drop of infected malaria blood look like a drop of coffee. And so we added special particles to the patient's blood that would bind a malaria target. We spot that blood on a glass slide. And as the water begins to evaporate out of the blood, the particles with the target run to the edge. Now, it's true that when it all dries, it looks like that pre-wash up there. And that's not very clear. But because the target binds to the slide and binds to the particles, we can dip it in water and get rid of all the gunk. And what you're left with is a ring. That ring is the same ring that you make when you spill your coffee. And it actually means that the patient would have malaria. This kind of test costs seven cents to make and doesn't need any additional technical skill other than the ability to spill your coffee. Now, the last example of a toy box diagnostic that I want to tell you about is about glow sticks. And when my kids were in middle school, they would come home from parties, and they always had glow sticks. The kids love the glow sticks. We've seen them. They're down at the river at the 4th of July, or they're at the party you went to last night. In my house, the glow sticks always ended up on the floor or the sofa. So one morning while I was having my first cup of coffee, I picked one up, and I started playing with it. And I don't know when the last time you played with a glow stick was, but when you play with them, you bend them, they're very flexible, and you can hear it crickle and pop. And you ask yourself, what's going on? And it turns out that a glow stick is a pretty interesting device. What I discovered was that when you uh, manufacture a glow stick, you have an inner chamber, an inner tube, and that tube is made of some brittle material. And you have a flexible, translucent outer tube. And when you flex that tube, the inner brittle tube shatters. You have a compound in the inner tube, a compound in the outer tube. And when those compounds react, the product of that chemical reaction glows. You have different chemicals 
you get different color glow sticks. Then it hit me. I could make my very own glow stick that could detect malaria. How, you ask? Well, it just turned out that a student of mine had discovered a chemical compound that when it bound to a malaria target, it glowed blue. No malaria target, no glowing blue color. And so the idea was pretty simple. We take that brittle inner chamber, we fill it with the special compound that binds the target, we put the brittle chamber inside an outer tube, we add the patient sample to the outer tube, we flex the tube just like you activate your glow stick when you go camping, and if there's target, it glows blue. No malaria, no glowing whatsoever. So this, despite the fact that this test works best in the dark, it requires no additional equipment to read, costs about 50 cents to produce, and can be made on the exact same equipment that mass produces glow sticks for distribution all around the world. Now, we have to remember that it's true. Without diagnostics, medicine is blind. But we also need to realize that low resource settings don't just exist in the developing world. We have low resource settings right here at home. It's a low resource setting at the homeless encampment under the bridge by the river. It's a low resource setting in many parts of rural America. It's a low resource setting across Native American tribal reservations. What we need to be thinking about is making effective, assured diagnostic devices for everyone, everywhere. And we can do that. All we have to do is play with our children, clean up the kitchen counter, and open our eyes to the everyday objects in our lives so that we can discover new principles and new objects which we can transform into assured diagnostic devices. Thank you.